there we are. Hi, everybody. I, um, for some reason, I scheduled two Zooms uh, for this time slot. I must have done one last week when I thought I was being uh, efficient and proactive, but I don't think I sent that link out because uh, I see everybody's names uh, that I sent the link out to just a little while ago. So um, we'll go with this, but I'm going to keep, uh, keep my eyes open um, and my ears open in case I get some emails of, hey, Pam, where's my invitation? <laughs> Ah, love technology. Well, everybody, hope you're doing well this evening. Um, I, uh, ah, I need a haircut. Um, I had some, some really neat experiences as I was walking into work um, this afternoon. Uh, well, one, I slipped on the ice, so be very careful. when. Pam, I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Uh-oh. Let's see. I'm not muted. Um, I can hear you. I can hear you. I, I can hear. Okay. It's been out though. Like maybe, uh, maybe turn the volume up. Does that help? Um, let me send him a quick chat um, message. And um, I'm glad, glad that at least some of you can hear me. <laughs> um, but, uh, what I was starting to say was, um, I can't talk and type it. Um, see if that fixes things. Um, right, so yeah, slipped and fell in the ice. So be careful if you uh, are, are heading, or even though it was warmer today, it was also, um, that just kind of made the ice a little bit slippery. Um, and two, I heard uh, some hooting going on. Uh, there's a, a great horned owl that was uh, near, if you're familiar with uh, downtown St. Charles, uh, there's a building called the Shelby School, the closed um, elementary school. And it seemed to be somewhere uh, in one of the trees around there. So I'm gonna uh, walk that way um, on my way home tonight and see if I can uh, hear a little bit more communication. We're getting really close to the time when uh, gray horned owls will be laying their eggs. Uh, they're usually uh, sitting on their eggs uh, by Valentine's Day. Um, and they're usually actually hatching their eggs sometimes in February. Uh, they're our earliest um, breeding birds in this area. So uh, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open uh, for ice <laughs> and, uh, and for owls. So with that said, um, we'll go ahead and get, um, get our program started for this evening because we got all kinds of cool things to cover. Um, and I'm gonna remember to share it this time. <laughs> uh, let's see, what do I have here? I'm gonna share, except that's not the screen I wanted to share with you. <laughs> all right, let's try this one. All right. So you know, every week I threatened to talk about some of these photos and last week we actually carried through on that thread and we talked about uh, this photo down here of the chipmunk uh, feeding on what turned out to be uh, a frog. Um, this week we're actually going to talk about the frog up here in the uh, upper left corner. Um, it's a, a photo I took um, actually several years ago down in southern Illinois of a little gray tree frog uh, peeking out of a uh, cavity in a tree. It was a, a lucky spot. We were um, actually sitting having lunch and um, I like to explore holes in trees. Maybe that's a hobby of yours too. You're in good company if you admit that here. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I was so surprised to, to look in the hole and, and see something staring back at me. So um, looking at that photo, remembering that, that fond experience reminded me uh, that coming up um, in the month of February, there are a number of uh, workshops planned. If any of you, I know some of you are already frog monitors, um, and if, if you're not, but I uh, have heard about the program, um, now's your chance to get involved. And if you've never heard of it, 
uh, let me tell you just a, a little uh, quick synopsis. Uh, going back now uh, about 20 years, a group called Chicago Wilderness formed this citizen science effort called uh, the Calling Frog Survey. And it was designed to um, kind of get a handle on the populations of the 13 uh, species of frogs and toads known to inhabit this area called the Chicago Wilderness, which actually goes a little bit up into Wisconsin and over into uh, Indiana as well. But again, the greater Chicago region. Um, one of those species, uh, the pickerel frog, is really thought to be extirpated from the area. Uh, extirpated means it used to live here and now it doesn't. Um, doesn't mean it's extinct. There are uh, pockets uh, where pickerel frogs are still doing okay, but we haven't seen any here since the 1940s. The survey though, actually, um, one of the reasons they formed it was to take a look at what was going on with a, uh, the frog that's pictured here, which is the, uh, the cricket frog. This used to be one of the most uh, populous species of frog in Illinois, and its uh, population in the northern third of the state really dropped uh, starting in about the 1960s. There's still some, some um, theories being kicked around as to why that happened, but um, one of the great things that came of it was uh, A, the this, this survey was formed, and B, because of the survey, we are uh, keeping a, a close eye on their populations, and they're actually starting to come back in areas where they had disappeared from. So um, uh, anyway, the, this is a, a great way to, to learn a little bit more about uh, the frogs and toads of our area. You can take the training and not actually uh, sign up for a site, but if, if you do want to go forth with the monitoring, uh, they ask for a, a minimum of three different, um, three visits during, um, to a single site during three different monitoring periods, starting uh, about the end of February and going through uh, early July. Um, frogs, different species of frogs call at different times, and um, they, they, some of them start very, very early, um, like the, uh, the wood frog, which is another somewhat elusive species. Um, it's, it uh, calls at a very, um, calls very early in the season. There's a lot of times there's still ice out on the ponds. Um, it also has some specific habitat requirements. So does it occur in King County? It, it, if it does, it's, it's quite rare. But anyway, uh, they're the earliest and bullfrogs are the latest uh, of our uh, calling species. So, and there is some overlap of these 13 species. You'll learn uh, that and a whole lot more uh, if you sign up for one of the Training dates. These are listed on that website, which is frogsurvey.org.org. And um, because of uh, this pandemic that we are still doing, with, all the trainings uh, for 2021 are going to be virtual. And you can sign up. I, I kind of wonder if this is the wave of the future for these trainings. Um, because it, it really has simplified a lot of things. You don't have to leave the house. Uh, you get the uh, same quality, or actually probably even higher quality of, of training than you used to. I believe all of these are being taught by Allison Besser Dodi Vallot, who is the, boy, listen, listen to that little spring peeper in the background. He's uh, trying for some attention there. Um, anyway, Allison Besser Dodi Vallot is the uh, coordinator for the entire um, Frog, calling Frog Survey. She is a herpetologist at the Peggy Notabart Museum downtown. So anyway, these are a great way to learn about frogs. These are the dates. Um, go to the website if you're interested. It is frogsurvey.org. Now we're going to go along, uh, switch gears a little bit. We're going to go to something that is warm-blooded and has a uh, coating of feathers. It is the snowy owl. Um, I, I'd written about these guys uh, last week because I'd heard uh, a few reports of people that were seeing them uh, down in Chicago, along the lakeshore, uh, lakefront, and then uh, west of here. And I thought, you know, this, this isn't uh, what we would call an eruption year. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about eruptions, eruptions with an I, I-R-R, 
eruption, which is a, a sudden increase in the species of animal. Um, oftentimes it has to do with uh, lack of food in one area and the species travels to another area. Um, snowy owls uh, will sometimes come down here. They will erupt um, and th that cycle seems to follow the population of lemmings, which is a, a important part of their diet in their, uh, their breeding habitat, which is up uh, in the Arctic tundra. But uh, every year we do get uh, a few that come down here. It typically uh, is, we typically see young birds come down here. Uh, young snowy owls uh, have a lot of barring, um, it helps camouflage them against the snow. Even though snow is white, it's rarely is it pure white. And those bars uh, in the feathers help them blend in a little bit uh, better. They um, will come down here because the um, just like with our the uh, the owls that we have in our area, the adults always claim the best territory, and then their offspring kind of have to fend for themselves. And some of these guys will, will, will travel quite a distance over the winter time uh, looking for a source of food. Our Counterpart here in Illinois to lemmings would be voles, and we do have a very plentiful vole population. So uh, these birds come down, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, sometimes we'll, uh, they'll show up along the lakefront in Chicago, but the other place uh, they tend to occur is um, out west. Now, um, this uh, is, if you look at this, um, this was a picture I took on Saturday. Um, this is out in DeKalb County. I just took it through the windshield. Um, it kind of looks uh, like the same view you'd have if you were on a dog sled uh, going across uh, the, the Arctic tundra. Now, um, I did do a little cheating, and that's what these other slides are here. Um, I don't know if you'd call it cheating or research, <laughs> but there is um, a fabulous website called eBird. It's uh, housed uh, or operated through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's got a real simple address, uh, ebird.org. Um, it's a data repository. There's a lot of birders who will um, record the information uh, about the species they're seeing here. And it really helps build a, a big uh, international uh, network of uh, bird sightings and uh, it's just it's a it's a, a wonderful tool if you're into the the numbers uh, behind the science and the sport of bird watching. But it also is helpful for people like me who maybe aren't so much into data collecting, but uh, want to know where some bird hotspots might be. Uh, so I um, uh, went to the uh, the account that uh, our King County Audubon friends had so kindly set up for us at Hickory Knolls a few years ago and. Um, uh, clicked around, and this, this is something you can do too. You can uh, click on that Explore tab that's on the home page, and you can either explore by species or you can explore by region. You can enter, say, Illinois, and uh, you'll uh, see a list of the most recent sightings for Illinois. Um, sometimes there's even comments about uh, what the bird was doing, uh, when it was sighted. Um, or you can, you can also just type in something like, say, snowy owl, and uh, you can uh, then go to a page like this. They'll show you on that um, information page a range map, and then within this range map, there's a large map that you can click on. See the, that word large map? If you click on that, you can then um, zoom in to specific areas and you'll start to see all these pins showing up of sightings. Um, blue uh, pins are older sightings and red pins are uh, more recent sightings. And there have been a fair uh, number of snowy owl sightings um, west of here. I don't know how you guys feel about driving into Chicago. Um, you know, sometimes if there's a super cool bird, I know people will make the trip uh, down to uh, that area the Montrose Harbor, or there's also some areas along the South Shore that are pretty good birding hotspots. But if I have an opportunity to, to drive, I'm, I'm usually going to choose west over east. So I, I did do that on Saturday. I went out with a friend and we uh, headed towards uh, Caneville and uh, we hopped on uh, Perry Road and we just started heading west. 
Um, I showed you uh, what it looked like through the car window and how it looked very much like the Arctic. Um, this to a snowy owl who's visiting is probably a pretty welcome sight. And I don't know how they feel about the, the wind turbines, but um, that uh, snowy, uh, flat uh, terrain, uh, lots of uh, places to tuck in uh, amongst the, the corn stubble, uh, probably a fair number of uh, little rodents in the, um, the tall grasses along that stubble. So I, I think this probably would be a great place to spot snowy owls. Um, but for uh, a couple of things, one, um, time of day. Now, now, snowies are oftentimes spotted in the day. They're not the sort of bird that you have to get up at the crack of dawn to see. Uh, one of the, my favorite things about snowies is that they're noted for their sitting. They stay like to sit, they sit for hours. Um, especially if they're, you know, if they've got a, a full crop and they're, they're digesting, they're, they're not apt to move. Uh, and one of the features of our Illinois landscape that they really seem to uh, take uh, a great advantage of are our fence posts and our utility poles. Well, uh, last Saturday, uh, remember when we had that um, forecast uh, for the ice storm on uh, New Year's Day? Well, it, it did. We did get some ice. It, it was kind of yucky out that day. We did see some uh, some ice come down here, but boy, west of here, they really uh, got hit. Uh, I saw a lot of tree branches. Uh, actually, some trees were, were uh, broken in half from the weight of the ice. And just about every fence post and uh, telephone pole uh, was covered in ice. Now, I don't know if, if snowy owls will, uh, if that affected their uh, desire to sit on those posts, but I looked at pretty much every utility pole and fence post we came along. And we um, actually pretty much crept our way um, through these, these roads. A nice thing about this area, <laughs> there's no traffic. I, mean, I, I uh, didn't even have my foot on the accelerator for uh, long periods of time. We would just kind of look with binoculars and uh, see what we could see. Now, um, those of you who know me know I, I would aspire to be a great wildlife photographer, but I don't think it's in the cards for me. I've taken classes and I've practiced as best I can and I still take pretty crummy photos. <laughs> but, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to this picture here and uh, if you can see my pink cursor, I'm pointing out a dot. And if we zoom in right there at that dot, Let's see if I can it in even more. You'll see that that dot actually does have a shape. Um, it has not a snowy owl kind of shape, but a coyote kind of a shape. Um, and there, there was a, a pair of coyotes that were um, probably hunting the same sorts of foods that the snowy owls would be after, uh, the, the voles that uh, proliferate out in these fields. So um, we added uh, coyotes to our uh, wildlife list for the day. And then uh, this was kind of a fun surprise as we, we looped around and started heading back east again. Huge bird flew across the road, a uh, huge bird, long tail, uh, and then a couple more followed it. And I counted uh, probably uh, 26, it's over two dozen um, ring neck pheasants. Uh, these uh, birds, I know my, my dad used to talk about hunting pheasants as a kid and, and uh, some of my coworkers here at the park district talked about, you know, when, when they remember when there used to be pheasants around. Um, we don't see them as, as much as we used to. Um, I remember talking with a, a state wildlife biologist and he said that uh, pheasants and turkeys, now we, we tend to blame coyotes, um, we non-biologists people, you know, think, well, you know, coyotes are out there. Of course, they're going to uh, eat these ground nesting birds. But actually, um, great horned owls do, do a, a pretty good job on uh, feeding on these birds because they can fly in silently. A, a predator like a, a coyote will, will come in. And even if they're moving uh, stealthily, uh, the bird can, can still sense their presence and take off. But uh, great horned owls... Um, 
you can fly in without making a sound and, and uh, grab one of these birds pretty easily. But um, apparently either there's no great horned owls here or we were near a game farm that had had some escapes, I don't know, but there was a, a good number more pheasants than I remember seeing in decades uh, out in DeKalb County. So that was kind of a, kind of a fun surprise. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're looking to, to make a similar trip, um, go ahead and check out eBird. Uh, look on Google Maps, kind of plot your route as I plot your route as I mentioned. Um, we headed out, um, we went through Caneville and uh, went north of Caneville and headed west on uh, Perry Road. We went past Lone Grove Forest Preserve. Um, and uh, the, the nice thing about driving around uh, rural areas like this is that the roads are pretty much uh, on a, a grid. There's east west and there's north south. Um, there's not a lot of cul-de-sacs or uh, courts um, along the way. Every once in a while you find a dead end road, <laughs> but um, for the most part, uh, as long as you can, you can keep your bearings with east, west, and north, south, you really uh, can't get lost. Uh, we went through a little town called Elva. Uh, around Creston is where we turned around to come back, but it's, it really felt like we'd, we'd gone, um, you know, visited an, another state because of the, the difference in uh, the view, the train, the, the quietness. We got out of the car a couple times and there's just peace and quiet out there. It's pretty cool. Anyway, if you're looking, um, there are still snowy owls being seen out there. Maybe you'll be the lucky ones to see them. Um, now, when I was researching um, snowy owls, I came across this, um, actually, I listened to a podcast uh, out of uh, Champaign-Urbana, and they interviewed the gentleman who founded the Owl Research Institute. They actually have uh, kind of an outpost up in uh, far northern Alaska where they're studying snowies, uh, but they, uh, they study a lot of different owl species. And it was a, a, a group I wasn't familiar with, and they're uh, definitely uh, bootstrapping their way along, but they've been doing it for over 30 years. Um, give their, their website uh, a visit if you get a chance, owlresearchinstitute.org. Uh, they've got a lot of cool projects going on, um, and they're doing some pretty solid research in the field of um, owl biology, owlology. <laughs> Um, and since we're talking about owls, um, let's uh, give a little bump to our friends Bob and Kathy. Um, the Andrini's longtime birders, um, former uh, president of the Kane County Audubon Society, uh, they are giving a talk on birds of prey this Thursday at the Aurora Public Library. So if you get a chance, um, sign up for that, uh, aurora.libnet.info. And I go to their events page and you, you enter, um, you sign up by entering your email address. So lots of fun there, lots more opportunities to learn about these cool animals that are living right in our own backyards. Now, um, we started a couple of weeks ago looking at, right about the time we got some snow, we started looking at uh, tracks in the snow. And I thought uh, this would be a good animal a uh, couple of animals to uh, point out because, uh, well, one, um, I actually had to uh, talk to a wildlife removal guy. We've got some activity from this particular creature at my mom's house over in Wheaton. Um, I'd seen some tracks. Uh, my mom's uh, caregivers <laughs> heard some noises. Sure enough, we have one of these things living um, in a place it should, <laughs> in my mom's house. Uh, but anyway, this uh, is the uh, a track that you can identify, learn to identify by looking at the individual prints, but even more helpful, you can identify it by looking at the pattern that it leaves behind. It is the work of the raccoon. Um, these guys, their they're, um, front paws, uh, which uh, is the right, print here um, right next to the key, almost looks like a hand. And this explains how they can get into uh, sheds and garages and they can open garbage cans. They, those little front paws um, are very, very well and they're very adept at um, manipulating um, things like um, uh, latches and, and cords and things that we've tried to put out to keep them out. Um, the uh, hind foot, um, isn't quite as um, dexterous, but um, does look like a very long-toed human foot. 
got that foot-like shape. So uh, hind track on the left and front track on the right. You notice how they're kind of paired up. Well, these um, animals, when they walk, they lumber. And you'll notice a, um, um, they move uh, one side of their body at a time. You know, a lot of animals will have an alternating gait where um, they'll put their um, uh, the front right foot and the left rear foot will move together. Um, these guys, they, they lumber along moving the same side of their body at one time, kind of like the, the way a little bear would walk. So it produces a track that's paired up. And where this is useful is if you see, uh, now this was over at uh, 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 Leroy Oaks. This was some, some tracks that were going across some, some kind of thin ice on Fearson Creek. And uh, you can see that the tracks are different shapes, um, the, uh, the tracks that are paired up. They're side by side, but they're slightly different shapes, uh, a front and a rear, a front and a rear. So, um, and they, they tend to kind of um, fall into place um, they, they, it, so that the, the, um, the tracks are, are, create this paired pattern. Um, you can tell it's a raccoon without having to go out on the very thin ice and uh, risk falling through. Um, it's, a, it's a handy way to be able to identify that. Now, uh, an animal like a mink will um, produce a bounding track that also has paired tracks, but the, uh, the tracks, um, the, the feet that land together are going to be the same. So two front feet will land together, two rear feet will land together, and the tracks will uh, be uh, you know approximately the same size, whereas on here you can see the tracks are uh, different sizes in uh, slightly different shapes as well. So the paired tracks like this will tell you that a raccoon was lumbering. Picture a little little bear uh, rumbling and uh, mumbling its way along uh, the snow. Now. Um, I get this uh, photo a few years ago from a gentleman who was, uh, speaking of little bears, he was wondering if he maybe had one. Look at the size of this track. Um, four inches wide and even more than that long. He said, uh, you know, if we go back to the heel here, we're looking at something that was uh, about six inches long. Well, um, he was that sort of uh, concerned but also kind of excited, like maybe I'm going to be the neighbor who has a bear in my backyard. Um, well, it, it actually you know, wasn't a bear. It, it's a raccoon, and we can tell that from the one, two, three, four, five finger-like um, uh, marks from the front paw. And then this back here is where the hind foot came and landed where the front foot was. So um, uh, the, this... It, Photo was also taken after a period of time where we'd had some freezing and thawing. Freezing and thawing will change the size of a track as well. They'll tend to spread out over time. So we ended up uh, with, a, with a very large track um, and what he'd hoped was a really great story, but um, it was a raccoon <laughs> that was in his yard. Now, um, so these tracks, and I got excited because we don't always get to see this animal's tracks in the snow. We'll see it oftentimes in mud. Um, it too has uh, a sort of hand-like front paw, much smaller though. I'm sorry I didn't put my, um, my lip balm down to show the difference in size, but this is you know, maybe an inch, maybe a little bit more than an inch around in a very round sort of appearance. The giveaway though is this hind track. We've got one, two, three, four toes pointing off to the side, and then we've got, whoa, what's this? It's an opposable thumb on the rear foot. This is an opossum. Um, if you wanna talk about an animal that is poorly adapted to the climate it lives in, let's talk about the opossum. Look at this thing. Uh, bear tail, bear ears, bear nose, bear feet. Um, they have a, a tough 
time when we have very, very cold weather because they just don't have, even their fur, I mean, it, it gets a little thicker, but even a, a winter opossum a coat is still kind of coarse and um, you don't uh, get that sense of warmth that you do um, when you look at, a, say, a thick uh, coyote pelt. Um, and they actually are a, a, a southern animal that has very steadily marched its way north over the last uh, several thousand years. Um, they are um, a marsupial. Uh, they've got a, a pouch under here. They've got uh, this prehensile uh, tail. Now they don't hang from their tails the way uh, they are sometimes depicted in cartoons. Maybe a very, very young one, if it loses its balance, can try and catch itself, but they don't sleep hanging by their tails or anything like that. Um, this thing does tend to get frostbite, so we don't see them during uh, the, the bitter cold, but the kind of cold we've been having, I, in fact, I was just talking to someone earlier today, it's really been quite pleasant. You know, a lot of days in the 30s, Possums will remain active uh, in the 30s and they'll come out, they'll come to bird feeders. Um, this was actually uh, below the feeders at Hickory Knolls. Um, possum uh, having a snack. So um, the, the tracks here are um, you know, a similar kind of a gait, but not paired side by side. It's more um, uh, in a straight line, front hind, front front hind and the giveaway for the opossum look for that opposable thumb there on the uh, the rear foot so it makes them such good climbers too Alrighty. um now this was a fun article that both uh mike uh, tillman's and kim Haig, you sent me this um we some of you have been been uh, signing up week after week know that we've been having a lot of fun with uh black light and uh, finding out what sorts of things fluoresce underneath black light. Um, it was sparked by an article that uh, platypuses, there was a discovery made that platypuses will fluoresce uh, pink under um, uh, black light. And then there was also the discovery that flying squirrels do the same. And then uh, I guess not to be outdone, uh, some uh, curators down at a museum in Australia just started walking around and shining a black light on their collection. This is a bare-nosed wombat fluorescing under black light. Uh, here's a frilled neck lizard and a Mauritian flying fox. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny, I, I laughed when I read this article because I did this exact same thing. I walked around uh, the office here and I walked around the nature center with a black light um, shining, you know, does it glow or does it not? Kind of like, remember when, uh, was that David Letterman that did that? Will it, uh, will it, we remember when he dropped things off the, the top of the building, you know, will it splatter? Um, you know, will it glow? Will it not glow? Um, so we had all kinds of fun, uh, here and, uh, these guys had all kinds of fun, uh, at their museum down in Australia. Well, then the article went on, uh, to, quote this uh, scientist, this Swedish scientist, who said, um, yeah, you know, it's neat, but that's really all it is. He doesn't really feel as though there's any uh, biological um, role that this fluorescence is playing. Um, he thinks it's probably just a coincidence that the uh, materials happen to uh, fluoresce. Um, <laughs> comparing it to human fingernails and teeth. Um, so, you know, I read that and I thought, well, gosh, that's a buzzkill. Uh, but I did, um, the article also mentioned this piece of research. This is a 2017 paper that um, was, they, they looked at um, all, I mean, thousands of different organisms. Um, it, uh, hitting them with with black lights and trying to figure out did it play a role in that particular organism's survival or not and alas they came to the conclusion too that um, uh, let's see how they put it here we conclude that most observations of fluorescence lack enough evidence to suggest they are used in visually driven behaviors I don't know 
that's kind of a buzzkill too, uh, but it's still fun to, to uh, walk around with a black light and see how different things glow, what colors they glow. And who knows, you know what, We're, we always, any, any kind of research humans do is going to be tainted by the fact that we are human. We have our five senses and that's how we perceive everything. Uh, it could be that uh, some of these um, other uh, organisms, uh, algae or worms or squids or parrots, um, you know, they might have uh, senses that we have yet to discover. Anyway, I probably haven't seen the end of fluorescence because it is really fun to walk around with the black light. We might bring this up again sometime soon. But instead of uh, black light fun tonight, we're going to switch gears and we are going to play a little game. Uh, this past uh, December holiday on Christmas, I received a game called Bird Bingo. Now, I have yet to play it, but it's your, your standard bingo game. But instead of calling numbers, uh, each player uh, gets a card that has um, 16 bird species on it. And then there's a big kind of master board and a bag with little tiles. And you pull a tile out, you call the bird species name, and then... Uh, you play till somebody gets a bingo. So I uh, was kind of, you know, reading through that, kind of wondering, is this a, a game we could play on Zoom? Well, I was watching the news the other day, and they mentioned this game, Poetry for Neanderthals, word game where you must speak good or get hit with stick. And yes, it actually comes with an inflatable uh, little rubber um, no uh, club that you can bonk your uh, people you're playing with if they don't uh, play by the rules. But basically, it's um, um, it's got very simple rules. Uh, the key to the game being you can only speak in one syllable words. Um, you uh, can't um, use uh, words. You can't say you know this word rhymes with this word as a, as a, a clue. But I. Uh, I was thinking about is, you know, is there a way that we could combine bird bingo and poetry for Neanderthals? And what I came up with is birding for Neanderthals. So we're going to try this. Um, uh, I'm going to pull up the, uh, the chat screen here so I'll know. Um, you guys are um, going to play along here. Um, Let's see, where is my chat? Um, okay, here we are. Hold on. Let me pull it back up again. Um, no, it's not showing while I'm sharing the screen. All right, so, all right, so you're going to have to buzz in, and somebody's going to have to shout out the name. So. Put all your inhibitions behind you. Uh, we're going to play a round of birding for Neanderthals. Uh, ready? Set. Go. All right. This bird. Blue. Like oak nuts. Pressed. Blue Jay. Blue Jay. Uh, up. Did I hear it? Yep. Blue Jay. Okay. Wait, let me get the uh, ding, ding, ding. Correct. Okay, so birding for Neanderthals. We've got some here in the group. All right. We're going to try it again. Uh, get your, uh, your uh, hairy knuckles on the buzzer. We're going to play another round. This bird look like Ghost at night in arm shed. Burn owl. Burn owl, yes. Burn ding, 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 ding. All right. Get to go to the end balls. Burn owl. We got one more. This bird. Not from here. Act mean to geese. Bump. 
Say it again. Did I hear? Mute swan? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is what happens. <laughs> I spent too much time alone. <laughs> For Neanderthals. Um, that's the last round of this week's uh, game, but um, I think I might put a few more of these together. Uh, I, I chose those three because those were the only three birds in the whole set. Um, there's, I don't know, like 64 or so different birds in bird bingo, but they were either um, not uh, North American species or they had really long names that could not possibly be shortened to one syllable. Laughing Kookaburra, uh, Splendid Fairy Wren, even Northern Cardinal. I couldn't, I guess I could have shortened that to Red Bird, but um, then we'd sound like we're Illinois State fans. Um, so uh, maybe I'll um, come up with a few other uh, species, not in bird bingo, but um, local to this area and we'll play another round of Neanderthal birding again sometime soon. So thank you very much for playing that fun game. Um, no, I thought it was fun anyway. All right, let's, uh, let's um, get a couple of updates uh, to relate back to you. Now you um, might recall a few weeks ago, I was all excited about uh, witch hazel and uh, took pictures of, pictures of the uh, seed pods and um, Notice that there were some growths on the tree that were not um, seed pods. So this, uh, in this photo here, uh, the seed, uh, this is um, actually taken from a, a glass tube that I have sitting on my desk. Here's the seed case that, that opened up. Um, each case uh, contains two seeds and they open up uh, somewhat uh, violently and they fling two seeds in, uh, in either direction, and that's how we get more uh, witch hazel. But there were these, these um, spiky looking things too that looked uh, sort of like a, a seed, but as it turns out, these are um, the witch hazel gall aphid. And um, I had snipped these off and I put them in this glass tube, and the other day I was, believe it or not, cleaning here at uh, Good Natured World Headquarters, and I looked in the tube and I thought, oh, those galls are not alone anymore. Here on the end, it's opened up, and uh, probably because I warmed it up uh, here in the office, these are the witch hazel gall aphids. I have completely messed up their life cycle. They aren't going anywhere. Um, but I thought it was interesting because um, with, with some of our other galls, um, they, they kind of have to uh, um, plan ahead. The, the larva will, will actually chew a, an exit hole out of the gall bef um, because as an adult, it doesn't have chewing mouth parts. And I, I kind of wondered how it was that these aphids were going to get out of these galls. Now, a gall is something that forms uh, when eggs are laid and it, it prompts, uh, there, there's some chemicals that prompt a growth response on the plant that creates this little um, haven or sanctuary for the, uh, the larvae of whatever the gall insect happens to be. And in this case, um, these aphids, um, they, they've got uh, sucking mouth parts, not chewing mouth parts. Well, uh, apparently this gall opens up on its own and it creates a pretty large exit hole. Um, there's, there were two galls in this tube and um, they, only one of them has opened up and it looks like there were one, two, three, four, five aphids that um, exited from there. So I, I'm gonna keep an eye on it and see if, uh, if any more of these galls um, open up. Um, don't know if I'll share the update or not unless I can figure out a way to, to keep them alive. But the other half of the, uh, the witch hazel uh, gall aphids life cycle is, is spent on um, birch tree, uh, usually a river birch. Um, and uh, um, I 
don't have river birch here in the office. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, it was um, just kind of a, a neat finding. And I thought you might appreciate seeing just how tiny these, uh, these insects are. This is uh, the lines of a piece of notebook paper behind it. So uh, they are um, probably without the, uh, the wings about an eighth of an inch in size. So, so quite, quite tiny. Um, and uh, living, not living anymore, but sitting at my desk. <laughs> Um, and then uh, a couple of you had asked about um, uh, good old dining room spider. Um, she's still hanging in there and she's still feeding, which I think is so interesting because um, a lot of times uh, if something only lives to reproduce and she has already laid her eggs, uh, feeding is not on the uh, agenda anymore. And it's really just maybe drinking some water until such time is, um, uh, she's done. But um, I uh, fed her, uh, well, I tried to feed her over the weekend and um, I, I kind of messed it up. I, I have uh, some uh, feeder cockroaches that um, desperately need something to feed to uh, because I'm getting a lot of roaches and um, uh, Miss uh, Dining Room Spider is only eating about uh, maybe one a week. So I, when I tried to feed her on um, Saturday, I scared her. In fact, uh, I scared her so badly that she didn't come out from under her leaf for about two days. But she did eventually come back to her uh, her uh, guarding of her eggs. So I dropped uh, this cockroach in this afternoon and um, made a little video. So watch. Uh, there's there's what I found in watching her feed, and I don't know how applicable this is to other spider species, but I, I always thought they, they fed rather quickly and they, they, they gave the, the bite, they injected the venom, slurped out the guts, and we're done with it. But she feeds for hours. Um, this was about an hour into um, her meal today, and uh, ah, let me hit the right arrow. There we go. Um, so watch up here, um, her fangs are moving very slowly. It's almost like she's um, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Um, I don't know if that's, if she's continuously in, injecting venom, I don't think she'd have that much venom to inject, but it almost looked like she was um, uh, grinding it between her two chelicerae, which is the the mouth parts that they have that have the fangs on them. But um, this this particular roach was about the same size as her, and I wasn't sure if she was going to take it or not. But uh, we're now um, let's see, we're coming. On, this is January twelfth. You, you might remember my communications with Spider Mentor out in Western Pennsylvania. And she'd kind of told me, well, you know, you get into January and, and your spider's probably gonna die. So I don't know, the, the fact that she's still feeding, we'll see how much longer she's with us, but she's been my <laughs> constant companion there in the dining room, breakfast, lunch, and dinner pretty much every day. Um, and I thought you might appreciate an update and if not, well, you know what? It's okay, we're done with her. Uh, we are going to um, look ahead to what we've got next week. Um, it's, uh, it's coyote time. Uh, I saw one when I walked to work the other day and I um, talked to a person earlier today who uh, has also seen one in their yard. So um, they are um, approaching their breeding season. Um, February is the uh, well. It's the month of love for humans, but it also is the the uh, month of mating for pretty much all of our local uh, furries: the the coyotes, the raccoons, the opossums, the skunks. Um, lots of uh, activity as we get into February. Anyway, we'll take a look at them. Uh, we're going to take a look at um, is what's one of the most unusual uh, track findings that you can make in this area or any area where this animal occurs because it doesn't usually leave uh, recognizable tracks. We're going to play another round of what's inside your pockets. Um, got some funny reader emails I wanted to share uh, and more. Um, now I'm going to stop this share because there is one more thing I wanted to show you. Um, oh, 
hold on, now I can see, uh, now I can see the comments. Um, <laughs> Diane said the frog noises are making your dog nuts. That's so funny you say that, Diane, because um, a friend of mine who, a Facebook friend who is also a wildlife biologist had um, uh, shared the call of a Cope's gray tree frog. And I was playing that, listening to it, uh, and all of a sudden, I, I have three dogs, and they were surrounding me, and I think they thought I just got them a squeaky toy, but I wasn't <laughs> you know, sharing it. Uh, so yeah, frog calls. Um, the keys to being a successful frog monitor is listening to those calls um, over and over and over until you can kind of replicate them in your head. So that may make you want to be a monitor, or that may not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> dogs and frogs. <laughs> Okay, and then um, Julie Long shared that um, uh, coyote hunters out there, uh, yes, um, in fact, there have been some reports of coyote hunters as close as uh, Pooley Road, uh, which is over in, um, what is that, rural Elburn. Um, and then you know, uh, birders are reluctant to post snowy owls in the exact location, yeah, because we don't want people um, harassing them. and. Uh, in fact, that's that, um, oh my goodness, Julie also says that photographers that were baiting them with mice to take better pictures. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I, I did mention this uh, in the, the column that I wrote, is that the birds that are down here, one, they're in, a, in an unfamiliar location, uh, even though it looks tundra-like, it's still Illinois and it's thousands of miles from their, their actual homes. Uh, they're generally a little bit stressed. They tend to be young birds that have been, uh, come down here uh, because um, their parents have, they have forced them out of their home territory and they're just you know, flying in search of food. Um, and further stressing them out by playing calls um, is, is frowned upon, um, chasing them, uh, all the things that you hear from the National Park Service to not do with bison or moose also apply to snowy owls. You just kind of want to uh, put as big of a lens on your camera as you can and, and observe them. Or, uh, you know, take a, a picture from a distance that, uh, distance that just shows up as a little tiny dot on your picture, then you can say you saw an owl. Um, but yeah, those are, those are good points, uh, Julie. And, uh, I know, I, I saw on eBird that uh, there, there were some uh, King County Audubon members who were uh, successful uh, just within the last week or so, seeing owls out there. Um, even if you don't see an owl, it was just, it was just a fun little diversion in a very, very different, um, uh, sort of, like I said, I felt like I was on a little vacation because um, it was just so quiet and so, so desolate out there. Very cool. Now, I wanted to show you, um, I don't know if we have any um, forestry people or even woodworkers. Um, this is a, uh, an ash tree that uh, former co-worker Mark, Mike Horton um, he had fall down on some property that he owns and he was cutting it up and it has this cool design in the center. Something was feeding on the heartwood of this tree. Um, and I, I don't know if it was a fungus. It doesn't, there's no channels. And it goes through the length of the branch. Mike said this branch was, I don't know, 10, 15 feet long. And every slice that he took had this mark in it. Um, and so it, it went, uh, the, the length of the branch, um, and, and the, the heartwood, this part that's at the center, like this, this is the, the, the non-living tissue of the tree with all the, the um, nutrients and things that uh, move through a tree and, and help it grow and, and survive are out here. The, the inner bark and the sapwood are out here. The, the inner part here, this heartwood is just for stability, but um, it just, this really cool pattern. So I don't know if anybody has any guesses as to what that might have been. Um, I tried to push it in with my fingernail and it's, it's hard. It's not as though it was, you know, it's full of, I thought maybe it was like full of insect frass or something that it would be you know, soft and powdery, but it's, it's very hard all the way through. Um, Mike thought it was pretty curious. In fact, it was funny. He, uh, 
Mike, uh, all the time he worked here at the park district, he, he probably out of anybody else who works here would bring me the most things and the coolest things. And um, he started our conversation the other day with, well, you know me, I like oddballs. <laughs> Didn't know how to take that, but <laughs> what he was talking about was the, uh, the oddball things in nature. And um, so anyway, he left me this slice. If you have any thoughts, uh, I'd love to hear it. I'm going to continue to do some research. I've got some woodworking friends, too, that I want to talk to to see if they've encountered this, if they're <coughs> in the bowl or, um, you know, uh, this is something that they would seek out because it makes for a, a cool you know, pattern on a finished product or if it's something that... Um, and destroys the integrity of the wood and is bad. But anyway, cool thing. Wanted to share it with you. Uh, this is that. Yes, does anybody have any questions? Um, if not, you know, you know that I just dropped sawdust all over my keyboard. Um, a couple weeks ago when I was showing you the, the great horned owl that had uh, been killed uh, roadkill incident. Um, I got grit all over my keyboard. My IT guy here at the park district is not going to be happy because I actually had trouble turning my computer on and off. Anyway, um, if we end this session and I don't go away, it's just because um, I can't get my mouse to work anymore. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as we started out the program, I'll say it again, uh, technology. It's great when it works. It's not always my best friend though. Anyway, um, if no questions, anybody, I just want to say uh, it's great to see you all. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. And I uh, hope to see you back again next week. Play some more games. Have some more fun. Have a good day. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. Good night. It was great. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.